So I can make myself no happiness by intrigue. Female performance between stage and page in Frances Burney. In a recent and I think very important work, Backstage in the, in the Novel, by Francesca Sagini, um, who's, uh, you have a bibliography on your handout as well, I cited her there. Um, Sagini speaks of the interdependent fortunes of theatre and novel in the 18th century. Both, she says, were driven by the growing supremacy of print as the new communications technology for modern urban culture. Uh, and print, she says, comes to replace performance and oral narrative as the best means for reproducing the intimate and private dimension of individual experience. While the novel shapes its new realism by transforming the plots and paradigms of restoration and 18th century stage genres into diegetic form, the theatre increasingly adapts its styles and practices to the ethical expectations of the middling sort, representing in both tragedy and comedy a stronger resemblance between events on the stage and in the real world. Sagini draws helpful distinctions between three levels of what she calls transmodality, so the, the, the transference of mode between plays and novels. She talks about formal mimicry of the structures and patterns of the drama, intertextual references to and borrowings from dramatic sources, and metatextual references which draw self-conscious parallels with the drama. What I'm saying today touches on all three. Um, I think Bernie's very alert to the important differences between the public stage and the private theatre, um, but that's not really the focus of what I'm talking about today. The two examples I'm discussing, though, one is the public theatre and one is a private theatrical. Um, the case that I want to try and make is that transmodality for Bernie is about shaping narrative in ways that promote effective, affective feeling and ethical, moral response most effectively, whether on the stage or on the page. In her lifelong experience of private and public stage performance as both author and actress and audience, she became, I think, acutely aware of the issue of how to manage an audience's response. And in the novel, I want to suggest, she experimented with ways of making her readers self-consciously observe their own responses to the performance in the plot that they're consuming. Diegesis, or telling, in the novel, as opposed to mimesis, showing on the stage, offers particular opportunities to prompt this kind of self-consciousness in the reader. So a lot of the, pa the papers that we've heard this morning, I think, con contribute to this discussion, or for me, contribute very helpfully to this, to this discussion. Um, but I suppose I want to turn out our, our attention to the idea of, of performing for an audience or getting a re an audience to perform in certain ways through your performance. Um, in terms of genre, Bernie, of course, expressed a conscious preference for comedy over tragedy. On your handout, um, from the quotations... Do I have a copy of it? Um... Yes, yeah, so under introduction, sorry, second page, you have a quote. Um, this is a manuscript epilogue that she scripted for Jane Barsanti. It was performed at the Crow Theatre Dublin, 13th of January 1777, at the opening night of a tragedy by John Jackson called Gerilda. Jane Barsanti was three years younger than Frances, and she took singing lessons from Charles Burney. Uh, so Frances has Jane say... I like the smiles of laughing comedy in which the verbal muse more sweetly sings than when she bellows through the throats of kings. Not but I think a little serious love sometimes does well and may find feelings move, though nothing practised in the ways of men. Love is I scarce know what and goes I know not when. So Bernie's writing in the persona of Bersanti, but this also I think indicates something of her own sense of what made a heroine for the modern world of novel and theatre. In her profuse diary and letter writing, we observe Bernie observing herself, observing others. And I think she's especially interested in a, a kind of complex heroine, who I will be talking a bit more about in this paper, a heroine who's poised between tragic fall and comedic irony. So the heroine in comedy who also carries with her a kind of echo of tragedy, a, a tragic presence. Um, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, to set the scene, though, and, and to give you an example of this kind of heroine, 
um, I want to suggest that we look at a little comedic scene in one of uh, in Bernie's um, uh, memoirs, um, well, Bernie's uh, journal, I think it is. She describes meeting an unaccountable young woman in Bath in 1780. This young lady declares herself a misanthrope, unable to make herself happiness by intrigue. So this is a quotation on your handout next. It's a long quotation. I won't read all of it. Um, the conversation between uh, Francis and this young lady, the unaccountable young woman, turns quite bleak when it transpires that this young infidel, as Bernie calls her, is influenced by um, Hume and Bolingbroke and is embracing a philosophy of suicide as a meaningful response to her melancholy. And it's, a, it's an odd little account. It's quite hard to tell what the tone is, whether it's comic or, or serious, and I think that's part of the point. Uh, so if you just look at the last few um, sections of this quote, it starts with, there was something. Um, there was something in this freedom of repining that I could by no means approve. And as I found by all her manner that she had a disposition to even respect whatever I said, I now grew very serious and frankly told her, that I could not think it consistent with either truth or religion to cherish such notions. One thing, answered she, there is which I believe might make me happy, but for that I have no inclination. It's an amorous disposition, but that I do not possess. I can make myself no happiness by intrigue. I hope not indeed, cried I, almost confounded by her extraordinary notions and speeches, but surely there are worthier objects of happiness attainable. No, I believe there are not, and the reason the men are happier than us is because they are more sensual. I would not think such thoughts, cried I, clasping my hands with an involuntary vehemence for worlds. So Bernie's ability um, to poise her prose between tragedy and comedy, as she's doing here, um, and her rendering of, of a female consciousness that kind of occupies this troubled position between the tragic and the comic, um, has been observed by lots of her critics. I want to take Bernie's account of this encounter as a starting point for taking seriously what Bernie learned about the limits of intrigue as a form of satisfying narrative through her first-hand experience of intrigue on the Georgian stage. Intrigue is an important element in Georgian drama. Um, and I will come back as well to this slightly hesitant response to a histrionic parallel that you find in this passage. Bernie's strange little phrase, I wouldn't think such thoughts which is um, interestingly echoed in Evelina. So how significant are the choices of the plays um, she refers to in her novels? And how does the experience of the heroine's playgoing and the heroine's performing inform our understanding of their agency, their virtuous agency? I'm going to look more closely at the references to two 18th century plays in Bernie's major novels, William Congreve's Love for Love, of 1695, which is mentioned in Evelina, uh, Letter 20, Volume 1, Book 1, and Collie Sibber's reworking of John Vanbrugh's comedy The Provoked Husband of 1728, uh, which is significant in The Wanderer. Um, and yeah. Reading Bernie's fiction with an eye to her theatrical references, I want to suggest, sheds new light on the way in which she's exploring intrigue in the novel, the diegetic rather than mimetic possibilities of the intrigue plot. So a few words about intrigue, um, plays in the novel, um, and I've given you a, a section from Samuel Johnson's dictionary where he defines intrigue. Uh, it's an intriguing word itself. Samuel Johnson doesn't actually give a definition of intrigue, so it's not, a, it's not a word in his dictionary, but these are all the references or quotations that use the word intrigue that are mentioned in the dictionary. Um, he uses it mainly, as you can see, in terms of political intrigue or cabaling, working, working with, a, with, a, with a small group. But there is a quote, interestingly, from a play, Thomas Southern's play, uh, so you'll find it under Jade, Young Jade and Discover the Intrigue, Southern's Innocent Adultery. Um, so there, intrigue refers specifically to sexual intrigue. And, of course, the, the, the use of the word intrigue always carries this, this um, connotation, connotation or attachment to the idea of, of sexual impropriety. Generally, though, in Georgian drama and, and restoration drama, intrigue plots are plots in which groups or members of protagonists are plotting with each other in ways that are opaque to others. There are complicated conspiracies and stratagems within the plot of the comedy of intrigue. 
The complex plots and subplots of such comedies are also often based on ridiculous and contrived situations with large doses of farcical humour. We might think of Bernie's novels um, and plays themselves as these kinds of comedies of manners. Um, they're concerned with popular entertainments and set pieces in which different types of social behaviour are displayed, often satirically. Um, but I do think the comedy of intrigue is as important as the comedy of manners in her writing. Uh, a lot of the, many of her plots contain uh, are concerned mistaken or mysterious or recovered identity, um, and they also often involve the presence of conspiratorial men, men who are conspiring with each other. If you think in Evelina of the ways in which Mirvan and Willoughby conspire to set up um, Madame Duval in particular. Um, and these kinds of conspiracy by men often threaten um, the innocence of the heroine. Important to the comedy of intrigue is the element, of course, of farce, which often comes quite close to violence. Um, and as you see in Bernie's fiction, these moments of violent punishment, especially of ignorance and vanity, are think, elements that are commonly found too in the comedy of intrigue. On your handout, because I didn't have time to, 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 to do this in the paper, I've summarised the plots of the three plays that are referenced in the passages I'm talking about. It's on the first page. Um, so under your bibliography primary, you have William Congreve's Love for Love, John Van Bitt's A Provoked Husband, and a, a short farce by George Coleman, The Juice is in Him, which is also being performed, if you remember, just after Love for Love in those scenes um, in, in Letter 20. Um, and here, if you, if you look at those plots, you can see that they are full of these elements of intrigue and danger and manners that are found, um, that are so important um, to, to the novels. Um, the implication of some kind of complicity in sexual intrigue lurks over women, especially where they appear to be less than transparent, where they seem to be withholding some kind of information about themselves. And these are implications that shadow the treatment of both Evelina and Ellis, Juliet Granville in The Wanderer, um, and especially in scenes where they watch or perform in plays. So these, these women are women who are um, presented in the novels to other characters in the novels as, as having some kind of mystery around them, some kind of uh, um, question about their origins, and possibly some kind of question about their um, sexual um, integrity as well. Um, Bernie was powerfully attracted to one particular intrigue plot, and that's a plot about vulnerable women who are at risk in predatory... Sorry, I'm going to have to get some water. I'm going to open it. There you go. <laughs> OK, so uh, Bernice was, was very attracted to a particular kind of intrigue plot, a plot which concerns vulnerable women in a metropolitan environment without the protection of a powerful male or female guardian. Um, Evelina, of course, is a young woman who's lost her rightful inheritance due to a father who's denied her and a nurse who's switched her as an infant with the nurse's own child. Interestingly, um, as those of you who know a lot of Bernie's work will know, Bernie reuses this same intrigue plot in her comedy The Woman Hater. So in that comedy, we see Sophia return from the West Indies with her mother, Eleonora, after a long separation from her father, Mr Wilmot, who has denied his wife. And here, too, a nurse has submitted, her, submitted, substituted her own child for the, for the real daughter. Um, character types recur across her novels and her plays, and they often seem to originate in the playtext she loved and enjoyed. Um, so just to point to two, two character types of women that occur across her novels and plays... Uh, the first one I've already pointed to, that's the heroine who's put at risk by her guardians and parental figures who deny or fail her. Evelina and Cecilia in the novels of, that, of that, those names. Uh, Cecilia Stanley in the play The Whitlings is a, a similar type. Um, uh, uh, Juliet in The Wanderer. Um, and those heroines usually have particular powers of attraction and unrecognised wit, uh, which in the end win through despite those adverse circumstances. Um, and that role, that, that kind of type part, um, familiar to the drama, is particularly, I think, the part of Angelica in Congreve's Love for Love. Um, the second type, who's particularly attractive to 
Bernie, perhaps more on the comic side, well, particularly on the comic side, is that kind of rambunctious and uneducated man-hungry girl of lower birth um, who often appears in her novels. Uh, so the Miss Branton cousins to Evelina are an example of that kind of girl. Uh, Joyce, um, known as Miss Wilmot in The Woman Hater. Uh, Miss Watts, Eliza's half-sister in the play A Busy Day. Um, and those, that kind of figure, that man-hungry girl of low birth, um, is um, derived or owes a lot to the character of Miss Prue in Love for Love and the character of Jenny Wronghead in The Provoked Wife. They, they both are also this kind of type, um, sort of country girl um, who is innocent, but once she's introduced to the idea of sex, is, is off. <laughs> like, a, like a rabbit out of a trap. OK. So as well as character types recurring in the plots of the plays um, referenced in her fiction, um, uh, I want to suggest that knowledge of those plots is important both to the characters within the novels uh, and to us as readers of the novels. Uh, so let's look at these two examples. Evelina, in Letter 20 of Volume 1, um, dated Saturday, April 16th, 1773, Evelina describes attending a performance the evening preceding of Love for Love at Drury Lane Theatre, followed by a farce, The Deuces in Him by George Coleman in 1763. Uh, hang on, let me see if I can... There we go. We can watch an, we can watch an audience watching a play. Um, so knowing the play Love for Love... And I think Bernie probably chose a very well-known play precisely for that purpose, allows us to see the power dynamics of, that are being played out between the characters to whom we've been recently introduced. So the, so the play is also serving a purpose of sort of sorting out the different roles of characters at this stage, quite early in the novel. Uh, so we've been introduced to um, her grandmother, Madame Duval, and uh, the xenophobic bore, Mr Mervyn, um, and the men who are competing for Evelina's attention and still trying to assess her potential as a romantic interest. So Sir Clement Willoughby, Mr Lovell and Lord Orville are all in this scene. Evelina is made very uncomfortable by this play, by Love for Love, which she finds most indelicate. And in fact, by the end of the 1770s, um, Love for Love had been radically altered by Garrick to make it more palatable to a contemporary audience. So there'd been a lot of editing and cutting. That happens in about 1776. Six, and it's interesting to me that the play, uh, the performance that Evelyn is seeing is 1773. So she is seeing the unedited version, it, it, it appears. Um, but she's also, of course, the novel's published in 1778, so it's appropriate that she should recognise it's indelicate. It's, it's following Garrick's ed editing. Um, the hero, Valentine, of course, is a man who repudiates a mistress, fantasises killing the child she's, that mistress has borne him, and yet he still wins a witty and attractive heiress, Angelica, as his bride. The play also represents the sexual forwardness of an ignorant country girl, Miss Prue, um, and that role is, of course, itself a reprise of Marjorie Pinchwife in Wycherley's very well-known country wife. Um, Interestingly, Lord Orville talks with ease and apparent unconcern and doesn't seem to be troubled by the performance. But we are reminded, or Evelina may, reminds us, that that ease is actually a, a performance which is intended to protect the other women in, in, in the box. Um, because Sir Clement Willoughby and Lovell, as we've seen earlier in the ball scenes, are perfectly happy to disconcert and harass Evelina in public. Um, when Lovell enters the box, he pretends, if you'll remember, not to have paid attention to the play. He says he's been so busy observing the other playgoers, he doesn't even remember what the play is. And then he puts his hand in his pocket and brings out a playbill later on. He doesn't even know, he says, what the play is. Captain Mervyn points out the resemblance between Lovell and a kind of rattling rake character in the play, a man called Mr Tattle. And Lovell responds... So Lovell comes straight back, saying, well, I'm going to cast you in another role. He says, what do you think of one Mr Ben, who's also in the play? So at this point, as we, re we realise that Lovell has been watching the play attentively, that he's a, a rather more malicious and clever character than he's appeared, uh, Mr Ben is a returning sailor, insensitive to romantic feeling or to social nuance, so it's a very appropriate type to cast Mr Mirvan in. 
Lovell proves his malice, though, it's probably safe to attack Mr. Miver, and Captain Mirvani probably should be attacked, by turning next to Evelina. So Lovell turns to Evelina and says, I was most struck with the country young lady, Miss Prue. What do you think of her, ma'am? Um, now, Evelina's difference from Miss Prue, uh, he's casting her as Miss Prue, and she is a country girl who's come to London and is being introduced to, to self-conscious uh, sexual nuance, if you like, in, in public. Um, her difference from Miss Prue is proved in the next sentence because she says she's much provoked. So she's recognised that Lovell is suggesting she's a country simpleton, which Miss Prue nowhere recognises in the play because she's too stupid. Um, Evelina's words, though, are interesting. What she says is, I think, that is, I don't think anything about her. That's how she responds to Lovell. Um, and oddly, it seems to me that that, that that response also, whilst it's aiming to make a difference, also implies a kind of resemblance. So what she's saying, of course, is that a modest woman should have no thoughts about such sexual forwardness. Evelina shouldn't have thoughts about it because she shouldn't recognise it because she's modest. Um, but they also imply that she might be a character like Miss Prue who has no thoughts. You know, there's nothing going on in her head. Um, of course, in terms of the... And that's why I want to stress thinking about the sort of diegetic form of the novel. Because, of course, we as readers do know that Evelina has thoughts. We're privy to them because she's writing letters to Mr Villars. So we have, if you like, access through the diegesis of the novel to those thoughts that the play itself and the, and the public performance can't show us. Um, okay. So Bernie is using the play to reveal the dynamics between characters and, and the parallels between the characters in the novel and the characters in the play. But she's also using the epistolary style of the novel to allow us as readers, if you like, into the kind of green room of Evelina's consciousness. The green room is the place where, where actors retire between acts, uh, between their performances. Um, so, so we get that access to her consciousness. Few critics, and I won't linger on it, but not many critics know talk much about the farce which follows the performance of Love for Love in Evelina. But I think that too is a careful choice. Um, and if you've got time, it's a very quick read. It's a short one-act play. Um, the beginning of the farce in Letter 20, um, or Evelina's account, serves to bring an end to this rather painful conversation. So Mr Lovell's attentions are silenced because the farce begins. Um, and also to lift our spirits. But it is also another play in which a stupid prattler, an apothecary called Prattle, um, who is like Congreve's Tattle, serves to give a woman the opportunity to deliver a lesson to a lover who's overstepped his role in testing her devotion and virtue. So the presence of this play in this scene in Evelina might invite us uh, to question Lord Orville's chivalry at this stage, um, and to see, rather, in his observation of Evelina some shadows of the later persecution suffered by Camilla at the hands and the eyes of, um, of Edgar Mandelbert. So that play, um, George Coleman's farce, is a, a play in which uh, a suspicious man tests um, a virtuous woman um, to, to her limits, and she, she revenges herself on him. OK, The Wanderer, or Female Difficulties. Uh, let's just have a look at private theatricals, because that's where we are now. James Gilray's dilettante theatricals or a peek at the green room. Um, in Bur early in Bernie's last novel, we come to a better understanding of the dynamics between central protagonists um, in terms of the casting and performance of a private theatrical. So again, this is early in the novel, and the, private, the, the play that's chosen helps us to work out how the characters are going to be working out in the larger novel. Um, the play, this time, is The Provoked Husband. It's performed in a country house in Lewis, near Brighton. Uh, and in this house, a strange young woman, much later in the novel we know she's called Juliette Granville, um, apparently an émigré from the turmoil of the French Revolution, is being reluctantly accommodated by a penny-pinching martinet, Mrs Maple. The choice of the play is dictated by a Miss Arb, who's a kind of local celebrity who performs in private theatricals. Um, she's offered her services for the character of Mrs Townley in The Provoked Husband, um, and they have to perform this play because she says she would study no other. It's a part she knows, so she's saying, well, it's this play or nothing. 
Mrs Townley's is a very large part with lots of lines and it's a very interesting role. Mrs Townley is quite a kind of brittle personality. She, she's, a, she's a compulsive uh, socialite uh, and she's disappointed her husband who, who, who opens saying, why did I marry to be tormented by this, um, this, this woman? Uh, the play sees a, a process of her correction and final reform and repudiation of her, of her socialising. Um, and she, she turns back to wifely duties. Uh, but it's a very important and magnetic role and a popular role for female tragedians, particularly Sarah Siddons, and I'll come back to her as well. Uh, and Mrs Maple's radical niece, Eleanor Jodrell, um, who is a rival with this unnamed lady, Ellis, Juliet Granville, the unnamed incognita for the affections of Mr Harley, is running the production and she's cast the rest of the play. She's given herself the part of a foolish country aristocrat, Lady Wronghead. And already that sort of her wrongheadedness is, is connected to the part she's playing. Um, but it means, of course, that she can't enjoy scenes of romantic reconciliation with Harley, who is taking the part of Mr Townley, the man she loves. Um, as with the shenanigans around the private theatricals in Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, which is published in the same year as The Wanderer, the issue here, um, the complaint about the, or the worry about private theatricals is that they provide opportunities for close, intimate, physical contact between uh, people playing parts, Harley and uh, Mrs Townley. Uh, Miss Arb suddenly pulls out of her obligations and Eleanor first plans to take over the role but finds there are too many lines to learn. Um, Ellis, Juliet, um, who has been acting as prompter and has also diligently transcribed the whole part for Miss Arb after the script was destroyed uh, by a badly behaved dog, um, knows the part, so she gets cast in it. And it's her performance, as well as her behaviour, contrasted with the bad behaviour of other players, which wins Harley's admiration and increasing affection. Um, now, Bernie here too, I think, is asking us as readers to do more than note how plots map onto each other um, and to think about the correspondences between the dramatic roles taken and the characters in the novel. She's asking us also to think about our own response to the responses portrayed of others and the ways in which those performances stimulate affect, affective responses in us. Um, and especially to think about the peculiar combination of sympathy and curiosity around an enigmatic central female part, Angelica in um, uh, Love for Love and Mrs Townley. Um, but she has also come a long way in this last novel from the way she's working in Evelina. Um, uh, Evelina is treated with, I think, relatively simple irony. Um, we know that she's attracted to Orville before she admits it herself, for instance. Um, but there are more complex layers of irony in the treatment of Ellis, Juliet. Um, most of the narrative is focalised through Juliet, Ellis, but we actually remain quite ignorant about her. It's an interesting experiment in novelistic form, it seems to me, to have a, a heroine whose consciousness is at the centre of the text, but whose story, whose plot, is actually unavailable to us until very late in the novel. Um, it's in, interestingly in this play's rehearsal scenes that the heroine acquires a name, um, a, a first name. Uh, she's referred to as the incognita or the stranger at first. Um, then Miss, she's given the initials LS. Um, and there's a sort of, I, I don't quite understand the joke here. I think it must be pounds and shillings, L and S, when she's given that name. So it's a kind of rather horrible joke. So, you know, she's penniless. So let's call her L dot S. And those are the initials that allow her to book a stagecoach, a, a, a post-chase journey. Um, Miss Biddle, one of the actresses, doesn't hear that LS initials uh, right, so she says, thinks her name must be LS, Ellis, so she starts to be called Ellis. Um, and as Margaret Ann Doody has pointed out, um, for the French speakers amongst us who are most of you, <laughs> that word L, L, is the, the she is heard in the name Ellis. Um, so just to finish off, I want to look a little bit more closely at Bernie's self-conscious handling of audience and affect in this, um, 
in this scene, um, and I'm going to sort of turn somewhere else to get there. Um, Frances Burney, of course, played parts in private theatricals. She took the role of a neglected wife, Mrs Lovemore, in Arthur Murphy's To Act Fast, The Way to Keep Him, in 1802. She doesn't seem to have been especially accomplished as an actress, but she certainly understood well the business of the public stage. Um, she is, I think, most interested in the effect of acting on her audience, um, as we saw in the discussion of the play staged in Evelina. Um, in 1787, Burney met Sarah Siddons, the famous tragedian. Um, Burney was employed at court. Um, she's asked to entertain um, Siddons uh, by uh, the odious Mrs. Schwellenberg, first keeper of Queen Charlotte's robes. Sarah Siddons was about to give a reading um, of, Burney says, the provoked husband at the lodge, and one must assume that she was going to be playing the part of Mrs. Townley, because that, that's the part for which she was particularly well known. Um, Bernie complains that Siddons fell short of her expectations. There she is. Um, and that's an, another long quote on, you, on your handout. She says, I found her the heroine of a tragedy, sublime, elevated and solemn, in face and person, truly noble and commanding, in manners quiet and stiff, in voice deep and dragging, and in conversation formal, sententious, calm and dry. I expected her to have been all that is interesting, the delicacy and sweetness with which she seizes every opportunity to strike and to captivate upon the stage had persuaded me that her mind was formed with that peculiar susceptibility which in different modes must give equal power to attract and to delight in common life. But I was very much mistaken. As a stranger, I must have admired her noble appearance and beautiful countenance and have regretted that nothing in her conversation kept pace with their promise. And as a celebrated actress, I had still only to do the same. I still, I remain disappointed, she said. Um, it's an interesting account to me. Again, it's this, this idea of a, of, a, of a woman who's caught between tragedy and comedy. And she's disappointed because Siddons is too tragic and not comic enough. She doesn't have that sweetness and, and, and lightness. Of course, Siddons um, was a lead actress at Drury Lane, and she did take the lead in Bernie's uh, one um, um, performed play, El Giva, in the tragedy Edwy and El Giva in 1795. Um, and she was also cast, we know, in 1801 in the role of a pathetic and neglected virtuous mother, Eleonora, in The Woman Hater. But it's a not, I think, in, an, uh, in a play, but in a novel that Bernie wrote, that she got this perfect coupling of inner and performative sensibility, which she found missing in meeting Siddons, in Siddons' performance when she met her. So I think the, the kind of burden of the argument I'm making here is that the, it's, it's to do with narrative diegesis, which allows this careful balance of seeing inner, the inner identity and the outer performance that somehow the play can't get access, that the novel allows you to access for Bernie. In Ellis's performance of the part for which Siddons was often celebrated, Lady Townley, in The Provoked Husband, um, we see um, this reconciliation of inner and outward performance. Um, Lady Townley is a role that requires a sprightly and impassioned temperamental performance alongside an undercurrent of unhappiness so that you can get to a sudden penitence at the end. Um, Ellis's, Juliet, uh, Ellis's performance, it's interesting, is first described as quite hesitant and unre unremarkable in the first scene, but she rallies in the second scene. Um, and from this time, her performance acquired a wholly new character. So this is the last quote on the handout. The narrator says, Every feature of her face spoke her discrimination of every word, while the spirit which gave a charm to the whole was chastened by a taste the most correct, and while, though modest, she was never awkward, though frightened, never ungraceful. A performance such as this, in a person young, beautiful and wholly new, created a surprise so powerful and a, and a delight so unexpected that the play seemed soon to have no other object than Lady Townley and the audience to think that no other were worth hearing or beholding. For though the politeness exacted by private representation secured to everyone an apparent attention, all seemed vapid and without merit in which she was not concerned, while all wore an air of interest in which she bore the smallest part, and she soon never spoke, looked, nor moved, but to excite pleasure, admiration, and applause amounting to rapture. I won't read the rest of that handout quote because I'm running out of time and I want to conclude. So, But just to say that um, 
that seems to me to point to the peculiar power of Bernie as a novelist. She manages to centre our fascination on a woman and her performance, and indeed to render the novel almost wholly from the point of view of that woman, while withholding from the audience an understanding of um, her real identity, if you like, her real origins, an understanding of the intrigue that lies behind her, which the novel will then unfold for us. We, like the audience of The Provoked Husband, feel with Ellis, with Juliet, we're convinced of her authenticity, while the narrator keeps us in a state of intrigue about her past life and her future unfolding of, of, of a life. Um, and I think it's worth noting that in her accounts of these enigmatic performances of Sarah Siddons, of the in unaccountable ingenue that I mentioned at the start, the unaccountable woman, or of Ellis or Juliet in The Wanderer, Bernie puts some distance between the performer, the protagonist, and herself as author. In her account of the Sarah Siddons visit, there seems actually to be quite a deliberate ambiguity in the phrase celebrated actress. You can't quite work out whether it's Bernie or Siddons who's a celebrated actress in, that, in, that, in the grammar of that sentence. Um, so too, the unaccountable Bath acquaintance complains that she doesn't have the outlet of a facility of writing such as Bernie's to give her the pleasures that she can't find in her performance in the social world. So there's something about writing itself narrative that allows you um, to uh, perform, if you like, safely, um, or, or takes you a step further from just being um, a craftsperson or performer. Um, Ellis's gifts are those of a craftsperson and performer. She's great at needlework, heart playing, acting. Actually, Bernie had none of these gifts. <laughs> She's a great writer, um, and she doesn't have those other performance gifts at that level. So the capacity to create character, rather than the expressive powers of performance, or the power of lively representation of the real, those, I think, are the special and enigmatic property of the novelist and dramatist of Bernie herself. And I'll finish there.